Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Dave Van Horn. Thanks for being on the show, Dave. Hi, Whitney. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I appreciate your time being on the show, uh, Dave. Uh, I can't thank you enough. It's been a pleasure to meet you at numerous conferences and, and uh, uh, get to know you better here lately. But uh, Dave is the president and CEO at PPR Note Company. Uh, PPR Note Company is a financial services firm that primarily assists private equity funds investing in distressed residential mortgages throughout the United States. And I also wanted to add He's a host of the Mid-Atlantic Summit, which is a great event that I highly recommend. And uh, Dave, before you tell us about a little more about your background, in case the listener hasn't heard of you, uh, tell, us, tell them where they can learn more about the Mid-Atlantic Summit. Oh, wow. Uh, Midatlanticsummit.com. It's, it's that simple. And it's actually in October uh, 17th to 19th. And uh, we're, you know, we're pretty close to being sold out. So it's kind of scary because we're way in advance. So it's a testament to all the good uh, folks that attend and speak. And uh, it's only our second year, but we donated all to charity uh, for the homeless for Project Home. So kind of little pet project of mine to uh, give back in some way, you know. I'm not surprised that it's almost sold out. I mean, I went last year and it was fabulous. Uh, The networking was great. The information content was great. Speakers were fabulous and how you had numerous different rooms or no matter what someone's interested in there's some place they can go and, and dig a little deeper into the details of, of their interest or, or whether it's syndications or note investing and many different things well i appreciate the plug <laughs> sure no it's good it was good it, it deserves the plug but dave t- tell the listener a little more about your background and and what you're what you're up to right now well, um, I'm, I'm probably one of the old dogs of real estate, so to speak, because I've been doing it since uh, 1986 and uh, bought my first investment property in 89. So it's been a while. Uh, I started out in construction a- after college and uh, eventually started my own contracting company and became a realtor and a property manager and owned a title company, a lot of different things along the way. Uh, ran a real estate meeting, sort of like the uh, the old version of a meetup. And uh you know, I, I would interview speakers and then by having a large group over time, it, um, I had the opportunity, people would approach me to uh, pitch investment opportunities, you know, mostly in commercial real estate to my group. And that's kind of how it started with me raising capital for other companies. And then eventually, <coughs> excuse me, eventually I started raising capital for my own company. So that was kind of my s- secret way into the business of syndication which I've been doing probably over 20 years now. Um, been syndicating a little while. So, so you know, I, I didn't know that about you, but it, about our numerous things there, but started a group and, and could you elaborate on that group a little bit about and how, you know, people, you know, you got people to come to you, I mean, with their deals and wanted you to present them to the group and, and where you fit in that, in that deal then. <laughs> well, a lot of times I was, uh, well, actually the one company I went to, uh, it was a company out of New Jersey that I went to start raising capital for them and they were doing private placements and syndication for, uh, mobile home parks and storage centers, uh, that were in Pennsylvania, Indiana, and Michigan. Most of them were in Michigan and, uh, you know, obviously I'm in outside Philadelphia, so that's pretty far away. Uh, but we used to fly investors in, put them on tour buses and all, just like they do today sometimes. And uh, so, yeah, it kind of started that way. And then I did some development uh, projects as well, which were in the Lehigh Valley, just uh, for the listeners, that's halfway between Philadelphia and New York, along, along that Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton corridor, which was really growing in population. It was one of the top metros, believe it or not, in the U.S. Uh, for population growth. So because of, I guess, the accessibility of those two cities. And, uh, you know, we were doing some land development and things like that. And, uh, but sometimes not everything works out either. And then uh, right before the real estate crash, uh, there, we had someone come to our investment group that was talking about uh, pools of delinquent mortgages. I knew nothing about that. And then uh, my partner, John, actually did some investing in, uh, in those uh, pools and, uh, you know, made good money. And then we were, how are you doing this? And then right before the crash, we started PPR. 
and we started taking my skill set of raising capital and you know John was our acquisitions guy and would work through the assets and one thing led to another and here we are right so we, we started out as investors and you know today we have you know well over 100 million under management and we have 31 employees and you know so it's grown quite a bit um, and that company is kind of growing on its own I, I still do some real estate stuff and I'm um, actually started back into more and more commercial real estate syndication. So nice, nice. So, you know, I think it's neat though, you know, you were doing that group years ago and that was really like your thought leadership platform before the, the words thought leadership platform were, you know, were come, had somebody come up with that, right? It was so simple, Whitney. Here's what we did that was different than say, you know, a RIA meeting or something like that was we allowed people to bring their deals and we, it, we this concept was we would meet for a meal. And we felt that we would get to know, we would network better. I don't like the word network, but we would build, you know, relationships better by having a meal with somebody. I know that sounds corny, but uh, what my grandmother used to say was, you know, way to a man's heart's through his belly or something. And uh, so we would always have a meal, break bread and get to know each other better. And we had round tables and it was different than, you know, classroom seating, that type of thing at a normal, you know, real estate investing type meeting where they might be selling education or something like that. We just brought in a lot of free information and we allowed people to shop their deals. And it was kind of a buyer beware, you know, the network would act like Yelp basically. Wow. No, I like that a lot. And, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know many people who have been investing since 86 and as experienced <laughs> as you are, you know what? I mean, that's incredible. And you're still active and you're still growing just, uh, you know, a massive business now and, and very successful. But, you know, during those years, you know, you know, I briefly talked about it before the show, you know, you know, could you elaborate on maybe a deal that went south and, uh, you know, and, and maybe, you know, give us some guidance, you know, through that uh, and, and, you know, how, what maybe some uh, uh, some things that we see now or people focus on that uh, didn't matter during those deals? Well, nobody wants to hear about the horror stories. Whitney, I'm here to tell you about how truth, I'm, trying to, right? I'm trying to build a billion dollar syndication <laughs> with none of, with, you know, other people's money. And, and you want me to tell a horror story? Okay. Now, um, no, there's a lot of lessons in those, right? And uh, I, I guess the first one was, uh, we had done a, you know, we had a syndication that went bankrupt and you might go, Oh, that happens. You know, how does that happen? And, uh, the underwriting on the project was phenomenal. The team was very good. The, you would think that how can a project with great numbers go under, but it really went under uh, over ego of the partners suing each other. Um, they got into a dispute. They started suing each other and had nothing to do with the deal after that. And the deal actually went under, um, basically because one partner sabotaged the deal. So the other partner couldn't get it. And the one partner wanted to cut out the other partner. Um, so a lot of times, um, it's not something that you would think of, right? You would think of, well, it's the market or it's the project or it's the underwriting of the deal. It had nothing to do with any of that. Uh, in fact, who, the person that, or the outfit that bought it out of bankruptcy did very well, <laughs> by the way. So, um, it's unfortunate that you see that type of thing. And then it kind of snowballed and, and then multiple projects went, started to go under after, after the first one goes under. So you can, you know, the lesson there is know your partners cause it's like a marriage, right? Mm. Um, basically this was a business divorce. Uh, so that is, is not as easy to predict. Although a lot of your syndication documents can, uh, prevent that, uh, somewhat. So, and I think, uh, I think it, I like to see a, more skin in the game from some of the partners. Uh, if these folks had more skin in the game, maybe that wouldn't have happened. They would have resolved their issues. Um, Cause I think they were easy to resolve, you know, but it, it happens. And then I had another one um, went under one time was a, a land development project where a uh, great team, excellent track record, excellent background in commercial real estate, long history of projects, development, experience. And this was the market. Actually, the market tanked for them. Um, the project, the numbers were phenomenal. Everything was right, you know, all the, you know how we study data and markets before we go and invest? Primo area, primo data, you know, primo market, everything. Uh, but the commercial real estate market uh, took a hit and they were having trouble I don't know if you know, in development where you need like 60% of the, um, these were commercial office condos and you needed 
about 60% of the project to be sold or leased. Well, when there's no financing, guess what? We're in a finance driven business um, and it creates issues, right? So if no one is, you know, expanding businesses, the economy's down like it was uh, after the crash, uh, these are just outside forces. Nobody's expanding their business. Nobody's leasing more space. Nobody's developing more ground. Banks are reluctant to lend. So you see it snowballs. And next thing you know, you're, hold, you're left holding land that you're paying taxes on and eventually, you know, it stops making sense, right? So, um, so I've been in some syndications for 10 plus years that were going nowhere. And it's not a lot of fun doing the accounting and K-1s. Um, on something that's uh, a loss every year or whatever. But the, 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 I guess there was a, the biggest valuable lesson there is staying in communication with your investors, going the extra mile. Uh, I actually hired attorneys out of my own pocket, did a lot of different things to try to salvage deals. Uh, and then your investors know that. They're, your investors know that you go to bat for them. They know that you stay in communication, no good or bad or ugly you know, indifferent, you're, you know, you know, it's all about communication. And a lot of syndicators don't do that. Things start going a little south or a little awry and they stop communicating. Because uh, I've been in those syndications as a passive investor. Uh, you know, there are tons of communication until they get your money. And then after that, it's like you never hear from them again, you know. So there's plenty of that that goes on out there as well. So what are some ways, I mean, being in the business this long, working with this many investors and especially through some bad deals, but obviously some, some fabulous ones, you know, what are some ways that you suggest are, are best uh, to um, communicate with investors? Well, today it's probably easier than ever because you have so much technology, right? So, you know, years ago you didn't have, uh, you know, fancy softwares that, you know, help you stay in touch with contact management systems and things like that. But I think a lot of it's through um, events. Uh, we used to do a lot of webinars, a lot of uh, meet and greets. We used to have uh, Q&A sessions, cocktail receptions, things like that. Just the, the fact that you invite investors in periodically. Um, I don't say lift the kimonos, kimono, so to speak, you know, have an open door, you know, talk about the projects, the numbers, uh, just transparency is probably one of the biggest things, but it's also uh, leaving an avenue for them to get the communication that they need to feel comfortable and confident to continue investing or to invest more or, or basically, uh, you know, to basically be aware of what the project's doing, uh, why there's a delay, why there isn't a delay over ahead of schedule, you know, what's happening just to periodically report and things like that. I think it's, it's easier than ever to do that. Uh, but I, I think it's just being accessible, you know? Mm, I like that. Are you tired of answering emails from investors about when they'll receive their K-1s? Let the real estate CPA handle the accounting and taxes on your next syndication, and they'll file your tax returns by March 15th so you can get your K-1s to your investors by the individual filing deadline on April 15th. Not only will this reduce headaches, but it will help you retain investors over the long term by improving investor experience. The Real Estate CPA is now offering a special virtual workshop to the listeners of the Real Estate Syndication Show on how to answer tax-related questions from your investors. Learn more today by visiting therealestatecpa.com forward slash syndication. Uh, so, so now let, let's talk about this million dollar or billion with a B dollar <laughs> business you're building. Oh, there you go. Uh, well, in the note business or the distressed debt business, it's a little different than uh, real estate syndication. And the reason I say that is because we don't have as much opportunity to leverage. And that, that, that was similar to mobile home parks as well. Mobile home parks, uh, you know, there's not as much bank financing as there is with apartments. And that's, that's probably one of the, you know, you hear the advantages and disadvantages of both. So when I, when I see, um, you know, especially like mobile home parks, for example, there's a lot of accelerated depreciation. There's a lot of tax advantages because it's all infrastructure, right? So you can, you know, accelerate a lot of the depreciation. Whereas apartments, that's not the case, but there's actually more financing for apartments and there's more, you know, buyers of apartments. It, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's a little more sexy than mobile homes are, you know, 
but the, uh, so it's more bankable and, and that's one of the things I do like about it. But I think I like, um, this is going to sound a little hokey. I like a lot of different alternative investments. I don't like any one arena and I had originally started out in the single family space, but I do like the scalability of larger complexes. I like the, uh, you know, I like playing the role of sponsor. You know, I like, uh, being able to, uh, bring, uh, my experience and expertise to a deal. Uh, so I've been in a lot of negotiations over the years. So that, that, I think is an advantage uh, that I can bring for someone. So I enjoy the the art of the deal, so to speak. And um, so there, but I do believe there's, it's good to be in multiple verticals. And I actually run a group called Strategic Investor Alliance, which is for high net worth folks. And one of the things about that group is, you know, it's not just about notes. It's not just about multifamily. It's not just about you know, insurance funds and different things that we invest in. I like, I like these different vehicles because they all have different returns. They have different timelines. Um, they have different, uh, you know, market volatility. So there's a lot of advantages in being involved in different as asset classes is the way I look at it. So that no matter what the market's doing, you have something that's there. And I, and I think it's good for people to sweep some of their profits or uh, off the table into safer vehicles and buckets, whether that's, you know, qualified plans and IRA accounts or insurance contracts, as well as other businesses and other types of funds and investments. So I, I like to sprinkle it around a little bit, if that makes sense. Yes, of course. And, you know, looking at so many different investment vehicles, of course, I mean, you're so experienced, but how, how do you educate yourself about so many different asset classes or, or ways to invest? that's the biggest challenge because there's only so much time in a day. So, you know, in some ways you're trusting other folks uh, for their expertise and it's really, you know, being able to network with the p people that are experts in their areas that you can trust. So that's a, that's a little more challenging, but you are correct because a lot of these investments have different advantages, right? Like my, my note fund doesn't really have tax advantages, whereas your, you know, your apartment fund does. And your apartment fund might be a long period of time. It might be five, seven, or 10 years in length. My note fund is one to three years. And now we have a liquidity fund that's very liquid. Well, notes are liquid. Apartments aren't, right? Or, you know, mobile home parks aren't, or storage centers aren't, especially development projects. They tend to be a little riskier where there might not be as much cash flow in the beginning. So there's a whole array of, of different things that investors like, and it could vary in their uh, time horizon as well. Like you're a young man and I'm, I'm significantly older, right? Whereas my appetite might be different than yours and yours, you, you might have more time to ride out a longer project. Uh, then there's also real short-term funds too that might only last a year in, in length. You know, it could be a hard money fund or something like that. So there's, there's a whole variety of, uh, you know, different types of funds. I do like the real estate backed assets. I do like having collateral. Um, but there's, you know, there's a whole variety of different ways to uh, stay diversified where, you know, different markets aren't impacting all of your investing. Uh, and there's still opportunities for you. And you're not completely wiped out if something were to go sideways on you. So Dave, you know, with all your experience and this many years in the business, you've seen so many people come and so many people go and say they want to do real estate or they want to do notes and then they, they wash out, you know, right. But somebody comes to you and says, you know, Dave, I, I really want to do real estate syndication. I really want to get into this business, you know, and you got a minute to spend with them. You know, what, what's your advice for them? Well, at first, I think my advice is don't be afraid of syndication. Uh, you know, when I look back, how, you know, I've been syndicating a long period of time and I look back, I realized that I don't know how I raised capital without syndication, you know, and I real, you know, I quickly realized that syndication is like a big fat insurance policy, basically for everybody, for the investors and the fundraiser. Because if there's, um, you know, if there's, if there is a liquidation, it's, it's done through somewhat of an orderly fashion through you know, the private placement docs, because it, it actually, that's what it does. It, it, it expels out all the risks. It spells out what happens in a liquidation or wind down. And, you know, it acts, it does protect all the parties involved, right? Because if you don't have a syndication, well, who gets paid first when things go sideways? 
Is it the guy that sues first? Is it the largest investor? Is it the person that came in last? Is it the person that got out first? Like it's a big, you know, crapshoot. So, um, you know, syndication protects a lot of parties that way. And it also protects the syndicator because, um, you know, all these things were done properly and disclosed. And, you know, hopefully you have high net worth folks that it doesn't wipe those people out. So, you know, nobody wants to talk about, it's kind of like a, a prenuptial agreement for business or something. So there's a lot of advantages to syndication. And I think it enables you to scale. I think scalability is a big advantage and it uh, allows you to do bigger projects. Uh, and that scale also, you know, you do have to put together a team. I think that uh, makes sense, you know, focusing on what you're good at and what you're not and, you know, just coming to grips with that. That's important. But I think, uh, you know, not being afraid of syndication is, is critical. What are, what are a couple, we, unfortunately, we won't have time to dive in real deep here, but what are some uh, just buying criteria when you're looking at, say, you know, multifamily specifically and as far as syndication, uh, just some criteria, high level criteria that, that's going to help somebody to say, oh, you know, this is not a deal I want to pursue anymore. Or, no, this, this is looking pretty good. I think everybody wants to know the magical place or the magical geography, which to me is, I understand that, but it's really data. So it's really data, you know, I'm coming from the uh, mor note mortgage space, especially where we've kind of, that's our secret sauce is data. So it's all data driven. So for me, it's, it's a lot of data. And what I want is the best data that's going to give me the best locations and the best uh, upside potentially. Uh, and doing that research and that hard work up front. So the data, I'd love to share with you my data, but it's kind of the secret sauce of everybody's uh, magic formula. And yeah, am I looking in a lot of the same areas with the same thing? Sure, you'll, you'll hear people talk about population growth and the economy and jobs. And you're right, all those are important. Um, but then again, then there's some secret ones that we look at that might take us to an area that it, it wouldn't be, you know, for other folks. So I, I think it, um, it's trying to be, you know, figure out where the next curve's going is part of it. Right. So, um, you know, I, we're, I was just at a, a conference, uh, in New York and they were talking about where the artists move next. Right. Which is okay. Think about that, but it makes sense because it would change the, uh, you know, gentrification of an area, that type of thing, which is an interesting uh, concept, right? So maybe that's your secret sauce. It's where the artists are next, right? So that, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. yeah. And they, you know, or, or different communities are moving there. So it's, uh, you know, whether that could be tech folks, it could be, you know, people that want to live together, it could be all kinds of things. So there's, um, there's a lot of uh, ways to look at that. And the uh, develop a strategy. But here, here's the one thing I do want to tell folks is to don't get stuck on your strategy. Uh, your strategy is good for a year to 18 months tops. I mean, and if you just sit there going, oh, I can't believe I can't find deals or whatever it is, it's because you haven't tweaked your strategy. You're using your same strategy in every market and you're going, why doesn't it work anymore? And it's because you need to adjust it. And <laughs> that's pretty much it in a nutshell, right? No, so. I like that. The same strategy strategy doesn't work in every market. I yeah. like that. Um, so what's a way that you've recently improved your business that we could all apply to ours? Well, I have, I've always had coaches and I also, um, you know, I, I actually subscribe to the Rockefeller habits and scaling up and you'll hear some people follow traction, those types of methodologies. So I, I'm a strong believer in having a methodology in your organization, especially if you really want to grow it and scale it. Uh, some people want to, some people don't want to, and I respect both. I've been with both sides of that. But if you really want to scale a business, it's really about getting a players on that team. Um, I know if I were to do some things differently, I would do more from the HR side, uh, where I think a lot of people are lacking. Uh, and even if you can't afford that, you could do, you know, an outsource type arrangement to real, where you really start to scale. And, you know, one of my coaches, Lewis Schiff from, uh, he author of Business Brilliant, and he was tied in with the Inc. 5000. He always says to me when he was coaching me that, um, you know, what one thing is going to uh, catapult your business, your personal life this in the next 12 months, that type of thing. What's holding you back? Is it 
capital? Is it staffing? Is it a key hire? Is it software? Is it, you know, is it a JV partner? And really focusing on what that one thing is that's going to make a, a significant change. And um, I think it's just focusing on a few things and not trying to do everything yourself. You know? what's, a, what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success, Dave? Oh, gosh. Um, probably some of it's authenticity, uh, some of it's discipline. Um, I am a, a kind of an ambitious person, but I'm content. And um, I'm not the type of person that wants to be remembered for, you know, I was just with a guy, he managed over 100,000 apartment units. That's just mind boggling to me. But I, like, I don't want on my tombstone that, you know, oh, I bought, you know, this, I'm, I'm known for this many units. I don't know that that's who I want to be known for, Whitney. You know, so it's, uh, so for me, it's more about, um, you know, what can I do to give back? Uh, what, what has it been able to do for me? And, and a lot of, you know, in the distressed debt space, for example, ours was more about community stabilization, trying to modify people's loans to stay in the homes or trying to get uh, vacant for REO property back on the market, that type of thing. With multifamily, it could be affordable housing, could be a nice, you know, there's a lot of, I look at it this way, there's a lot of smart real estate investors out there. Could we do something a little more socially impactful with our businesses? And it, it's just a challenge I like to throw out to people, you know. Hmm. Could you do something a little different to make more of an impact? And I know you do as well, like everybody has their favorite, you know, things or charities and things like that. And it's all which is, which is cool. And I like being able to build that into something. Hey, could I do, you know, I have a buddy that has apartments for disabled vets, for example, right? So is there a way to incorporate a more impactful, uh, meaningful thing into our everyday business of, you know, syndication and apartment investing, that type of thing? Is there a need in your business right now that you'd like to put out to the listeners? A need in my business, right? Well, sure. We always need more capital. We always need more deal flow. Um, actually, you know, there's a ton of capital in the marketplace right now. I, I'm sure deal flow is the biggest things everybody's looking for. I do like, I do believe in um, thought leadership platforms because I know in the beginning uh, when I was raising capital, I would always be like, well, I need to know more people and I need to, you know, network more and build more relationships. And then I, and I even went to the point where I would tap into someone else's network. Oh, here's a reputable guy. He's got 30 years of, you know, his network. I'll tap into his network. And all that works, but it's, it's a little bit harder way to do it than if you're hosting podcasts or a blog writer, like I was a blog writer for a long time on Bigger Pockets or write a book or something like that. Whereas uh, if you approach it from the thought leadership platform, it starts to become who knows you instead of who you know, which is game changing. Um, so I think you want to find a way that people can get to know you and get to know the real authentic you and, uh, what you're about. And, and I think that's more powerful than just trying to remember everybody I meet or anything, you know, which yeah. is really hard to do these days, but, but you get the idea. So it's, uh, it's really about who knows you and how to get deals to come to you instead of, you know, in the beginning, everybody's on the hunt for the deal, right? But what's nice is when you can actually get the word out of what you do and what you're an expert at and the value you bring to the marketplace. And then you attract that business back to you without you having to hunt for everything. And I think that's what the real secret sauce becomes. No, I appreciate you elaborating on that. And yeah, I know you talked about it a little bit through our discussion, but I like to ask everybody how you like to give back. Well, um, I do a couple of things right now. Obviously, you know, I do the Mid-Atlantic Summit, which is a, a thing for homelessness, which has a, a soft spot in my heart. Um, I've known people that were homeless and uh, known people that passed away on the streets. But I, I also run a recovery center, uh, a drug and alcohol recovery center. And that I've had that for the last nine years. And we've had hundreds of gentlemen through this facility. And, uh, you know, I, it, a lot of those folks would be homeless as well if... Uh, we didn't provide a different alternative for them when they, when their insurance runs out or they get released from somewhere and they have nowhere to go. So, I mean, that's, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't, um, looking at the opioid crisis. Mm. Um, and a lot of people talk about it and they might be building walls and different things, but, uh, it starts with demand. It starts with education. It starts right here. And, uh, I think we all could do a little bit more if we put our minds to it. So, 
Dave, I really appreciate your time. You've provided some great content from your many years of experience and uh, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and get in touch with you. Um, well, uh, probably the easiest way is uh, pprnoteco.com. You can actually reach out to me there and uh, connect. Uh, I'm also on Bigger Pocket to answer a lot of questions, whether it's about real estate investing and note investing, uh, raising capital, all those topics are fun for me. And I'm in the forums every day. So it's probably the easiest way for people to connect with me, ask me a question or, um, and then I, you know, I'm on the road show a lot too. So I see people in various cities. Uh, I'll be coming to a city near you. <laughs> awesome. And, and don't, don't forget about your book. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, book, yeah I just uh, wanted to hold it up. And it, and investing. Sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I can't remember all this stuff. Um, <laughs> But no, it's a, it's a great book on leverage and strategy and, and uh, it, you know, it's just a different way to look at your real estate investing. Try to think about what you can leverage and, and what kind of finance hacks you can incorporate to your everyday real estate business, whether it's commercial or residential or whatever that is. There's a lot of neat things that we can do to accelerate our wealth building. So. Great. Dave, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you being on the show. Appreciate the listeners being with us today and I hope they'll reach out to Dave. I also hope you'll go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me and also go to the Facebook group so we can all learn and, and grow our businesses together. We'll talk to each of you tomorrow. Sounds good. Thank you, Whitney. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.